fit. Well, no, I'm not talking about how our clothes fit. I'm talking about how we fit in an organization. A lot of times organizations or people like me will talk about culture and we'll talk about talent acquisition. We'll talk about attraction. But what about fit? How do we know we are a great fit where we are? And organizationally, how do we make sure we're creating the fit and making that match work for everyone? That's what we're talking about today, that and a whole lot more on today's episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, where we are helping leaders grow personally and professionally to lead more effectively and make a bigger difference for their teams, organizations in the world. If you're listening to this uh, in the future, you could be with us live for other episodes. If you're interested in that, being able to perhaps even be a participant in what we're doing, you can learn more by going to our Facebook or LinkedIn groups, just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook, remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn to do that. And uh, and if you do, you'll get access to knowing when we're doing these, and then you can join us. I hope you'll do that. So uh, today's episode is brought to you by our latest book, The Long Distance Team, Designing a Team for Everyone's Success. You can learn more by going to longdistanceteambook.com. That's longdistanceteambook.com, where you can learn more, find out where to buy a copy, and get a free excerpt. Hope you'll do that. And now let me bring on our guest. I'm going to bring Andre in. There he is. And now let me officially introduce him and then we will dive in. Our guest today is Andre Martin, PhD. He's an entrepreneur, operating advisor, board member, organizational psychologist, and coach to top founders and C-suite executives. He has held key C-level leadership roles related to talent, employee engagement, leadership development and culture in some of the biggest consumer brands, including Disney, Mars Incorporated, Nike, Target, and Google. Early in his career, he worked for as, a, as an enterprise faculty member at the Center for Creative Leadership. And the reason he's with me today uh, is to enlighten us and to help us talk about his brand new book titled Wrong, Wrong Fit, Right Fit, Why, How, Why, why Excuse Me, why How We Work Matters More Than Ever. He is our guest. I'm so glad that he's here. Andre, welcome. Thanks for being here. Hey, Kevin. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here today. All right. So we got a lot of people joining us. And if you didn't hear it, you can certainly tell us, uh, say hello, tell us where you're from, and you might just get show up on the screen like that. Uh, Catherine is here. Well, she gets a paycheck for me, so that's why she's here. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> so I'm glad, uh, Andre, that you're here. We're going to dive in and talk about this new book, Wrong Fit, Right Fit. Um, but before we do that, let's talk about your journey. Uh, I like to tell, I like to say to people, like, uh, you didn't wake up when you were five and decide you wanted to write books about organizational stuff, right? And um, so sort of what's a little bit about the journey sort of beyond what I shared in the bio? So generous question, Kevin. I, I grew up in Southern Missouri in a tiny town in the Ozark Mountains. And I was a uh, second son of two college professors that taught at this school that, amongst other things, gave free education to rural youth. And so if you couldn't afford college, you're one of the first of your family to go, and you had the grades to be able to get in, they gave you a way to walk out with a debt-free education. And so I grew up in this place, skipping my own school a lot to hang out on the college campus, seeing the power of education to just change people's lives. And I think that's probably where the entire journey started. Instead of going to academia, I found my way into organizational psychology, into these great brands, and into this place where I started to become super intrigued with how do we allow all these brilliant people I'm meeting to be at their best every day? And so it took me to places like Disney and Mars, the Center for Creative Leadership, and then landed me in a place where I just wanted to help make that experience of being highly engaged, more available to more people, more days. I love that. So um, you, you say this in the beginning of the book, uh, that you started to write a book. I don't know what the, uh, why that ha happened exactly. And that doesn't matter as much as the fact that you say the book that you're about to read, this is my paraphrase. The book you're about to read is not the one I intended to write. Yeah. So I, I think that that shift is important. So why don't you start there as we start to dive into the book? You got it. So I, I originally thought I was going to write a book on how to build a strong culture in this new era of work, right? With the 
remote and hybrid and the post COVID sort of reality of trying to build a great workplace. And so like every good researcher, I'm a geek at heart. My first sort of entree into the book was I'm going to go talk to all of the brilliant, smart, smarter than I people that I know in the world and sort of ask them about their best work experiences. I think a few things became really true, right? The first one was there's not one way to it, right? So I, I, there was just nuances in the conversation that were really important. I think secondly is sort of standing back from the conversations. I started looking at this and said, you know what, in every company I've ever been in, at least 60% of people are pretty happy. They're content, they're doing a good job, they like where they are. And then there's this 40% that seem like they were slogging through mud. Same company, same skill set, didn't feel as good. And I started to think, you know what, there's not a company on earth that sets out to create a bad employee experience. And I don't believe there's any talent that walks in that doesn't want to do a great job. And if you assume those two truths, you sort of got to go, maybe the issue isn't culture. Yes, there's toxic leaders and yes, there's dysfunctional teams. But maybe there's this question of, hey, what if it's about fit down to the way that we work every day? And that's really where this journey started. So obviously that word is in the title twice, wrong fit, right fit. Yeah. And all of us probably have some idea what we think that might mean. Yet, I think it's important that you tell us if we're going to frame this conversation, Andre, when yeah. you say that, what do you mean specifically by fit? What I mean specifically by fit is, is that it's the extent to which you have a deep and authentic connection to the way that the company works every day. We're not talking about the product. We're not talking about the consumer brand. We're not talking about values. What we're talking about is the how work gets done. So how do we set strategy, prioritize, manage conflict? How do we socialize ideas, give feedback, develop people? How do we gather? How do we solve problems? How do we brainstorm, generate new ideas? All these things that make up like a random Tuesday morning at work. And so the book's really focused on saying, hey, up until now, most conversations are at too high a level. You know, you say we're an innovative company. I say, yeah, I want to work there. But there's a million different ways that companies like to innovate. And so the book really tries to, to double click into this idea of culture and really set it down. And if you don't connect to these ways of working, ultimately, it's going to feel like you're writing with your non-dominant hand every day. And if you ever tried that, Kevin, it's frustrating. The quality is terrible. It's stressful. You can get a little bit better, but you'll never be as good as you would with your, with your dominant hand. My team would say my handwriting is bad enough with my dominant hand, let alone my other one, uh, my team and my wife. Uh, so you have a, there's a, I was looking down, I was, I was going, there's a page in the book where you have, an, you have a pyramid basically. And you yeah. have to say all that stuff uh, up a higher on the pyramid is the stuff a lot of people like to talk about, purpose, values, products, all that stuff. But down below it says how we do work day to day. And that's actually our definition of culture, right? It's yeah. the way we do things around here. So what we're talking about here is, does the way that we do, we organizationally do things around here match with what works for me if I'm coming in as talent? Am I close? You're exactly right. And, and really where this came from is, hey, I, I had the opportunity, humbling opportunity to work at many of these really revered brands and great companies, right? And in every single one, I will tell you, Target is different than Nike is different than Google is different than Mars in the day-to-day -day the way the things work. And so pretty, again, it's very different in some cases, very different. And I think sometimes we assume that work is just work and that couldn't be less the case. And so helping people to get just that level deeper around how does this thing happen day to day? And does it sort of agree with your affinities and sensibilities about how you work when you're at your best? And if you get that match, Kevin, it's unbelievable to watch. And when you don't have it, it really, and this is some of the words of the interviewers that I, I spent time with, is they would say, you know, it, it feels like all my creative energy is going to coordination of work and not to my craft. I'm watching everyone else succeed, and it feels like they have a secret Dakota ring for success, and I don't have it. And you know how that feels when you're in that. You feel lonely. You feel isolated. You feel incompetent. And so you tend to work harder. And the harder you work, the more stressed you are. And then we know how that uh, spiral goes. And then, yeah, that can take us the wrong direction. So um, like any good consultant, 
uh, and, and a good researcher. And, and given what you said that you originally sought, set out to do, there, there's a few, there's a little section where you talk about what, what you see as the trends that are happening in the world of work, if you will. And, and I don't want to go through all of them, but is there one of them perhaps that maybe you don't think people are talking about enough that would be worth us chatting about for a second? I think given that the background you and I have in leadership, one of the most important for me was going back and looking at the consistent growth we've seen in the decade before COVID, right? We're talking like 18 quarters or really like 10 years of almost consistent GDP growth in the United States. And what happens, and whether you're talking about the whole US or the world, or you're talking about an individual company, the more you consistently grow over time, the less you're building those sort of wartime leadership skills that you need when things get hard. And so I think, you know, for all our conversations about work and toxic leadership, part of what's happened to a whole generation of leaders, us included, is that we haven't necessarily got to build those muscles that leaders need when times get tough. And so really well, they got was, tough really fast and they got tough really fast and you saw everybody scramble and we're still scrambling i mean the number of c-suite executives and chros that i talk to that are still struggling with how to create a really great workplace for people i think a lot of it comes down to you know leadership is muscle and if we don't use all the muscles we have we're just not ready to sometimes face into what the world's going to bring us so that's one of the trends that's really interesting to me so as it relates to to this conversation. Um, like me, you talk to a lot of, you know, senior executives, C-suite executives. So what are you, what's your sense about how they're, and it, again, it's all different, I realize, yeah. but we, sort of generalizing uh, their decisions, challenges, et cetera, et cetera, around where people are going to work. Like, um, even though a lot of organizations said, here's what we're going to do. Yeah. It's not necessarily happening the way they said they wanted it to happen. Like, what are you hearing there? What are you thinking about all of that? I'm just curious. Yeah, one of, one of my big thoughts is, is that location strategy needs to be the last conversation we have, not the first. Right? So there's a whole series of conversations that's going to lead you to the right decision around where people work. And so I sort of back all the way up and say, hey, what does your brand tell you is important to just the affinity that you're trying to bring to the world in terms of your service or product. And then it's about what are your work principles, practices, and platforms that are true when your company's working at its best, right? And then if you define those things, it's gonna naturally lead you to how ready are we to work hybrid, to work face-to-face, -face, or to work fully remote. But I think what's happening in the world right now is, is that's the first conversation we're having. Oh, and so yeah. we're, making, we're making this decision without understanding all the factors that need to be true for people to be successful in any of those cultures. And the last thing I'd say, Kevin, I'll turn it back over to you is I've worked in companies that were remote before it was popular. Mars Incorporated, now 150,000 personal organization, has a corporate headquarters that's 150. Everybody's out in the world. Right. And so it all comes down to how prepared is the system to allow people to do their best work wherever they are. And I think that's, we got to answer that question before we worry so much about yeah, location. The location is exactly the last question. The other thing is, I think that so many, and and I don't, I, I'm not trying to throw C-suite leaders under the bus by any means, but oftentimes we're searching for, well, what's the right answer? And there isn't a right answer. There's, There's a not. best answer for your organization. And that's the one we've got to go after. And that's why people, I think, get frustrated because that's that's a harder thing to try to figure out. Then just say, yeah. someone tell me what the right answer is. And hey, the last thing I want is for your CEO to be working in a way where it's like they're working with their non-dominant hand, right? So if you're a CEO and, and C-level leadership team that needs to be in proximity to do your best work, you better be in proximity to do your best work, right? Because, you know, at that level, you have to be able to honor the needs and expectations of your shareholders. And so again, I just think we're we're not sort of leaning into this conversation first by just taking a deep breath, taking three steps back, open our eyes really wide and asking ourselves, how do we work at our best? And if we did that, I think location becomes a little bit easier to answer. And you know, in the end also, once you can back location strategy with ways of working, platforms that we use, then your talent's gonna look at that and go, oh, that feels like a rational decision given who we are you got a better shot. Right. And, yeah. and some people still right. aren't going to love it. 
especially uh-huh. if it means you we need you in the office three days a week, four days a week, five every day, whatever. They may not love it, but you got a lot better chance of people committing to it because right. of the way you got there and 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 the reasons you used to get there. And at the heart of the book, I mean, this is kind of the the whole thesis of the book is we all got to start understanding the way that we prefer to work, companies and talent alike, because there's plenty of talent out there and plenty of companies out there. And somewhere there's a company that's waiting for a talent just like you. And when you get there and you find them, you're going to do the best work of your life. So, now I, yeah, I absolutely love that. And so we've been talking about, and we are talking everyone with, if you just, just got here, Andre Martin, the author of the brand new book, Wrong Fit, Right Fit. You can get your copy wherever fine books are sold. Um, and we've, we've been talking about fit, sort of the word you're using, you know, sort of frame everything around, which is awesome. We've talked a little bit about culture and we may do a little bit more about that, but there's another word that's out floating in our world these days. Um, that I'd love for you to talk about the relevance and the connection between what we're talking about and this word, belonging. There's all this t- conversation about creating belonging in our organizations. What's your thought about that? How is that connected to fit from your perspective? So, Kevin, I'll start with, hey, there's a lot of marginalized groups out there in the world to where this concept of fitting in, having to change who I am, in order to be seen and valued and to be a part of a system uh, that have felt the pain of that for a lot of years. And there's a lot of people out there working in that space. All of my colleagues doing brilliant work in diversity, equity, inclusion are, are really focused on that. I think the, the conversation in the book is sort of taking a parallel path to that, which is saying, hey, I don't want people to have to fit in. I interviewed 110 talent from around the world. and Whenever they talked about their wrong fit experience, they talked about having to fit in. They talked about feeling like they were having to do things that didn't fit what they valued, who they were, how they preferred to work, or their skill sets. And so I think, again, core to the book is, hey, everyone's got to fit in a little to be a part of systems, to belong. Like, you have to give up to get. Like, that's just a natural part of human relationships. And in the end, you know, humans, since the beginning of time, have used community and belonging to survive. It's one of our greatest gifts as as the human race. And in order to find belonging, you have to find sort of affinities in who I am. Are there people in the company who look and have the same values and backgrounds that I am? But also more importantly, this idea of, do they work how I work? Right. And so I think that combination of these two things sort of create a more holistic view of fit. And then, you know what? Organizations, I tell every leader in the world, you will never be able to be a place where everyone can come and fit, right? Because organizations are inherently different. That's the the whole definition of fit. Like, I'm going to find a one where there's a hand and glove, right? Yeah. And it's a whole definition of, of, you know, competition within companies, right? You're differentiated on any number of factors from your competition. That can be your product, your service, your go-to-market, and the way that your company works. But once someone crosses in that door, here's the thing that we're not seeing is I'm watching data that says one in three new joiners will leave within 90 days. 53% of people who've been at a company for six months are still looking for a job. 75% of people have the Sunday scares. And there's just all this data that says we're just not doing enough, even for the people that are already with us, to allow them to be a full part of this company. And so there's just a few fundamental questions that I think are important for leaders to answer, to re-recruit their talent every single day. Yeah, so I love that, this idea of re-recruiting. So let me, we'll get to those in just a second, Andre. So uh, by the way, if you're listening to this podcast, you might want to go back and re-listen to that list of, that litany of very sad statistics that Andre just shared. Because, and you might, and if you're listening to this at 1.5 speed, like go back and listen to that again at 0.75. And like, get that because that's really important stuff. Now, um, the book is really based around two ideas. Like, what do I, and I I framed it in the open. Like, what do I need to be thinking about to find the fit? But then you you were just at this idea of where are leaders? Like, what do leaders need to be doing to re-recruit their teams to make sure? And what do organizations need to be doing to identify this, these 
true cultural components, like how we really do things around here day to day. Like, so if, if fit matters from both perspectives, I'd like us to talk about both for a second, but, and I'm, I'm actually glad that you led with leader. So let's talk about that. What should, what should organizations and leaders be thinking about in relationship to this idea around fit as it relates to talent attraction, talent retention, and, and just anything else you want to talk about that for a couple minutes, then we'll go to all of us putting on our personal hats for a minute. Yeah. So leaders, you know, it start, it's kind of two things. I think first and foremost, if we start at the beginning, the employee experience, present a brand for your company and the way that you work at the very start that is more honest and more authentic than maybe it is today, right? One of the things that we see, Kevin, I saw this in all the interviews is there's like three versions of the company. There's the company that I'm recruited into, this brilliant, aspirational, really cool, best place to work on earth. And then there's the company I come in, I'm, I'm onboarded in in orientation. I get the best leaders. Which is still pretty good. I still got the best good. people. Still pretty good. I'm seeing the best leaders. I'm seeing the products that are having the biggest impact on the coolest customers. And then I walk out to my job every day. It's and like all of a sudden, the same thing. it's like I went from living on earth to living on Mars. And it's in that discrepancy, that mismatch of expectation where we drive down engagement in the first 90 days. And that curse should be going the opposite direction, right? Because the day before I start work, you know, when I'm sitting around telling my friends, my family, I couldn't be more excited than to join this company. And the yeah. fact that we start to have those mismatched expectations starts to just erode commitment off the bat. And so that's one. I think the second thing that's really vital is that we are re-recruiting people every day. It used to be, if I got you here, Kevin, I gave you a computer, you went and did your job for 20 years. Now, you know what? Like everyone's got their head up. We're all infinitely browsing. We're watching where the grass is greener, waiting for our next opportunity for someone to tell us that they value us and they see us, and then we're going to jump ship and go. And Unfortunately, so however, to our last point, we could go through that exact same cycle. And where we end up may not look at all like what we thought it was going to look like. And we're back, not in a whole lot different place than where we are now. Right? Yeah, but except to your point, like every job hoppers out there, like more power to you if that's the way you want in your career. But realize that every time you hop jobs, you're putting an enormous cognitive load on your mind, on your body, and you've got to rebuild networks. You've got to understand ways of working. You've got to build a reputation again. So I think if we could just be a little bit more purposeful in terms of how we look at our companies and lead, back to our leaders real quick, because those questions are fundamental, right? If you're going to re-recruit your employees, you got to answer, why is the world better with us in it? You got to give them purpose. You got to remind them how we make money and where they sit in that, in that formula or that supply chain, because work's got to be meaningful. You got to remind them how we work at our best, right? Those really fundamental ways of working. And then you have to remind them of the unwavering promise and how you're making them better or leaving them better off than when they walked in the door. And you got to do that in every touch point, every moment, all day long. And being a leader is super hard today for those reasons, because you, you just can't take your foot off the pedal. You're constantly in a fight for the commitment and attention of your employees. So Andre, the big chunk of the book Right. Yeah. So like this is now I'm going to say this. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Right. This is a leadership book, yep. but this is also a career development book. One hundred percent. And and I would say there are more pages associated with the uh, career development than anything else. I mean, that's not really what we've been talking about a whole lot here. Uh, so and we don't have a lot of time left, but I'd like you to sit to talk about a couple of ways that we can be as individuals. Mm -hmm right? Who are employed by somebody at whatever level we're at, right? Frontline, front level leader, front level leader, CEO, doesn't matter. Um, what should we be doing? What's a little bit of advice other than buying the book yep. to help us get clearer about fit from our perspective? So when we're looking through the lens, we are more likely that we're going to find that fit. Kevin, the worst thing that, that job seekers can do is to start their job search by looking at an actual job ad. Because the minute you look at the job ad, you're in a marketing machine. You're in a process designed to sort of have you drive towards confirmation bias and choose to buy. It's just like, it's just like consumer buying, right? If you, if you think about the job search, just like walking into the cereal aisle at the grocery store, 
right? If you walk into the cereal aisle without any idea what you're going to buy, you're there for 35 minutes because there's just all kinds of good choices. Well, there's like seven SKUs of of Cheerios. That's right. Or maybe 10. Just Cheerios. Anyway, go ahead. if If you stopped yourself right before you got there and said, what am I actually looking to buy? What am I solving for? And so the purpose of the excursions in the book, again, from the interviewees, the one thing they all said is, I wish I would have done a little bit more self-reflection before I started looking. Those excursions ask questions like, what do you value in big decisions? How do you like to work? Who do you like to work for? What are you solving for today? What's your career about? Is it about company, craft, cause? And so there's these great excursions that will get you centered and grounded. And then what happens is once you have that information, when you look out at the world, you're already more discerning than you would have been otherwise. Yeah, because you, you're you more centered and you have more clarity and that helps you a whole lot to start to immediately toss some stuff away, um, uh, which I think is really, really valuable. And, and, and everybody, there's, there's tremendous resources in this book to help you do exactly what Andre is saying. And so I hope that if that's something you're thinking about um, for yourself, if maybe you're feeling right now like the fit isn't perfect for you, then um, don't 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 stop with just this conversation because there's way more that you can get in the book. And I hope that you'll do that. Uh, so, Andre, before we sort of go into the final segment of the show and our conversation, um, is there anything we didn't talk about? Is there any question I didn't ask that you hoped I would? Not a question you didn't ask, but there's there's one point that's been really important to me the more I've talked about the book. And it's it's this idea that often in our careers we'll mistake comfort for boredom or lack of momentum. And so one of the things that's been really important to talk about is this idea of, hey, the excitement of a new job, of greener grass, that's all dopamine, right? That is just you wanting to feel like it's a first date again. And first dates are very different than committed relationships. Committed relationships are oxytocin. They're a warm hug. And so sometimes when I talk to talent in these interviews, the one thing they said to me is they said, as I look back at my previous jobs, my right fit opportunities, I mistook comfort for boredom. And that had me leaping where I otherwise could have stayed at that company and probably had three, four, five, 10 more years doing really great things because it worked for me. And so that idea that the grass just isn't greener and just be really sure that you aren't growing, you aren't learning, you aren't comfortable, because comfort is okay. It's actually a foundation to doing some of your best work. Yeah, because it, it first of all, if you're more comfortable, stress, you should be, far, you should be better, more mentally fit. You should be more mentally healthy, which by right. itself should be a pretty good starting point there, right? Yeah. So a couple more things before we go. Um, I, I'm curious when you're not writing books and working with C-suite executives and and those sorts of things, what do you do for fun? Uh, I live in Portland, Oregon, which, as you know, is beautiful and green and filled with all kinds of trails and hiking. So I'm usually out with my two English labs, Bodie and the Fawns and my wife, and we're hiking around the trails of Portland. Uh, soaking in all this green and and beauty that we surrounded by. In case you missed that, everybody he has a dog named the Fonz. Just saying. Um, so, yeah. uh, and I also know, like me, you're a reader. So I'm curious. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I I already know because you showed me ahead of time. But like, what is it that you're reading these days? There's two books. One I did share with you. The first one though, which is in the book in my book as well, is called Dedicated by Pete Davis. It's this fascinating look at at this idea of infinite browsing and why people aren't as committed as they should be. And then the second book is brand new. It's from a friend of mine, Amy Edmondson. And she wrote this book called The Right Kind of Wrong, which gives us all this ability to gain really important insight and actually cherish the, the failures in our life with a, with a new light, greater insight, and see them as accelerators to, to future opportunity, which the book's just fantastic. Both those books, I'd say, pick up tomorrow. We'll have them both in the show notes, both dedicated and right kind of wrong. Uh, so did you notice that she has both of those words in her book, same as in yours, wrong fit, right fit? Fascinating, right? How we didn't even that? know, neither of us knew we were writing those books, but we all, we both sort of 
came to market at the same time. I called her immediately. I'm like, hey, what's happening? There's something in the in the world about right versus wrong, I guess. So, so Andre, where can we learn more? Where do you want to point people? Where can they get the book? Where can, how can they get in touch with you? Where do you want to point people? I'd like to point people two places. One is to my website. It's www.wrongfitrightfit.com. And secondly, Kevin, is I've just started a weekly Sunday night newsletter that's meant to be sort of what you read when you're drinking your first cup of whatever on your Monday morning. And the real intent of that is just to help people have a better week at work. And that's mondaymatters.substack.com. mondaymatters.substack.com and wrongfitrightfit.com. Andre Martin, you've been our guest today. It's a pleasure to have you. I'm so glad to have had you. Yeah. Uh, but before I let you go and before I let everybody go, I've got a question that I ask all of you every single week. If you've been here before, you know what it is. Now what? So we've spent about 30 minutes having a conversation about things related to fit at work and how that's maybe not exactly what we've thought about before and how not it's not about just flitting and flooding around, but really working to find a fit. And we've talked about it from both a personal and an organizational perspective. So the question is, what did you take from this that you will go take action on? Mm -hmm. What were the big ideas that you got that, that made sense to you that you made a, made a mental note of? You see, mental note's not enough. You need to say, here's what action I'm going to take as a result. That is the most powerful question I can ask you at this moment. I hope that you will ask it, answer it, and act on it. And I also hope that you will come back next week for another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We're here every week. Hope you will be too. Uh, like, subscribe, tell your friends. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kevin. 